before I talk about standards and ISO, um, maybe first let me introduce myself. I'm Martin Kolebjewski. I'm uh, from the HITS in Heidelberg. It's a non-profit private research organization in Heidelberg. And um, we are um, in our group uh, mainly also doing data management for life sciences, especially systems biology and systems medicine. And in that context, um, standards are really crucial. And I try to bring, uh, uh, yeah, to transfer this mes message to you today, uh, why they are important, how to use them, what is the difference between community standards and formal standards like ISO standards that um, were um, announced also in the abstract of this webinar. So um, before we talk about the two universes of standards and, and how that um, eventually might become one world, I would like to give you a rationale for that, why standards are in the life science so important it's, it has to do with uh, fair data, with findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And um, this is um, um, widely accepted now, as you probably all know, in our field. And uh, what we are doing now in Heidelberg, uh, together with colleagues in Manchester and elsewhere, <clears throat> is um, yeah, we provide data management platforms, data management services like in Fairdom, where we are um, heavily involved in our founding members. And um, there in this uh, system and services, we provide a platform for integrating um, data um, and other information. So not only data itself, but also models based on these data, SOPs that were used. Um, other information about projects and so on. And all that can be structured then, again, using standards like the ISA standard uh, that uh, you might know in this case study as uh, essay standard. <clears throat> and uh, from this perspective, um, when we bring all this kind of data together with our systems and our services, like uh, we do in networks like the Liver Systems Medicine Network in Germany, it's a large scale network where um, people from clinics together with researchers in a wet lab and also modelers come together to actually um, arrange their data, build up computer uh, models to simulate them and so on. And that's a highly complex thing. And all this data have to has to come together. And, and for this, you need the systems. And these systems only work uh, when, when there is a certain uh, degree of standardization of the data, of the metadata, so data describing the data actually. And um, we realized when we did a, a survey in the community, mainly in the community of systems biology at that time, uh, some years ago, that um, what much of the data actually in the community is not shared, even research data that is published. And so um, the, the data, uh, that is uh, underlying this, uh, these results published uh, are not shared for the models. It's, um, it's a bit better, but still almost half of the computer models uh, in these communities are not shared. And um, then we also uh, asked the people, and uh, there were hundreds of answers actually to the survey, <clears throat> why, um, um, uh, which which formats, which metadata and ontology standards they are using. So these are actually the main typics, uh, the, the, the typical um, types of um, of standards, the formats that you uh, use to format your data, metadata formats that describe actually the data itself. So data about the data again and ontologies to describe the semantics of the data. And um, there uh, is a good uptake of the formats. There's not so, such a good uptake in the community of metadata and ontology standards. Um, so that is what we realized. But why is the uptake so low, especially for metadata and ontology standards? And 
the, the reason might be, and that's um, a slight, uh, I have to thank for um, um, Susanna Sansone, um, who, who provided that slide, and it nicely summarizes um, the situation that it's a whole forest of standards in the life sciences that we have. So we have almost 400 different formats, that, depending on the technology or the domain you're, um, you're um, working in or the methodology that you apply for your experiments or for your workflows, then uh, there are more than 700 terminologies, domain-specific to terminologies in the life sciences. That's a, a huge, huge number. And uh, even the guidelines, so metadata um, standards, so kind of checklist catalogs, which kind of metadata data about data should be recorded. So there's a whole forest of these kind of standards and uh, these are either um, these, these are either uh, let, let me just use a pointer. These are either here um, defined by grassroots uh, organizations like uh, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health that you probably know, or um, or uh, some proteomic standards from uh, from UPO and um, uh, then you have also some more formal standardization organizations uh, that that uh, release standards like ISO. I come back to this uh, um, a bit later. Um, so you have this whole forest of standards, and the problem is so many standards. Uh, how to become uh, familiar with them without uh, being lost? And um, you can read, of course. Um, review articles like uh, well i have written one for the computational um modeling side of um biology uh, one one year ago roughly um but of course that's always only a small uh, snapshot of uh, what is actually available then you have um yeah standardization organizations that release standards that group standards and uh, these are typically grassroots initiatives. So, so grassroots means they, um, they uh, are released by a group or a smaller or larger group of researchers that have a certain problem of standardization that come together, agree on some standards. And one example here is the combined network, the computational modeling and biology network. And uh, there I'm also involved and, and part of the co coordination team there. So um, Combine releases some standards and brings together the, the, the standard developers in the modeling field in biology. And uh, when I talk about standards, these are then standards um, that represent knowledge. Um, like uh, Biopex or ESPO, and then you can have um, so ESPO is actually the synthetic biology open language. By the way, you can have standards for visual representation, like the systems biology graphical notation or ESPO visual, and standards for <clears throat> modeling and uh, yeah, actually for the formatting of models and their analysis. Now it's just an example of the modeling field in systems biology and because there's this sub uh, this this meta community of combine bringing together all these sub communities of standardization you have that in other fields in proteomics in genomics and so on to um, standards for models and uh, their uh, model formats and uh, their analysis like sbml systems biology markup language cellml neuroml and so on and then you have associated things like controlled vocabularies, like infrastructure, some some projects, and so on. I don't want to go into detail here because combined is not really the focus here. I just want to give you an example of a grassroots initiative that releases such kind of standards. What are these standards? So SBML, the Systems Biology Markup Language, for example, that um, uh, is used to export and import models from software tools, so computer models describing biological um, context, um, biological functions, biological entities, so on. And um, so it's a format for exchanging biological models between these tools. And um, 
you have certain uh, agreements in the standard um, how this transportation should be done in a form uh, in a standardized form. Then I said we also have um, yeah, graphical uh, notation standards like the systems biology graphical notation SVGN, where you have um, standardized way of describing, um, yeah, for example, biochemical pathways, signaling pathways, and such kind of things in different ways in a more um, yeah uh, expanded way with all the details or in a more um, condensed way. Um, and this is really standardized that tries to standardize, for example, textbook knowledge uh, representations. So graphics in the textbooks that are quite diverse usually, but with using such kind of uh, graphical notation standards, you can overcome this problem and have a, um, a coherent um, yeah, um, display of this. You can have then repositories uh, that survey um, standards like um, I showed fair sharing um, as a resource, resource um, in one of my first slides, um, which is a really broad uh, resource there and probably most of you know that already. It's also connected to Elixir actually and it's to my knowledge even a um, um, uh, recommended interoperability resource. And um, <clears throat> Then you have more dedicated, uh, more uh, domain-specific dedicated uh, portals like the Normsys registry that we have developed at HITS that um, that yeah uh, presents a bit more detailed information, but then only for the field of modeling in biology. So especially the combined standards that I mentioned before. And there you have information, you have links to specifications, to web pages, to model repositories connected to a certain standard like here SPML. Um, you also have um, information then um, about the usage of, of uh, different standards, SPML, CellML, SPGN, and so on, in different um, domains describing different uh, biological processes here. And when there is uh, a model example, uh, then you can, by uh, using these resources, uh, explore these examples and check how um, certain um, biological context is represented in which format. There also is information in these um, resources typically available about your yeah, transformation between one standard and the other. So when you want to transform data from CellML format to SPML format, you can, for example, use, use a tool DIP antimony and so on. So that kind of information you can find also in these resources. You can have sometimes also some validation uh, provided um, that checks a certain, in this case, a model that is uploaded to the resource um, and that is checked against uh, yeah, the standard description. Um, so all these kind of resources are available for these grassroots standards. Um, again, that is only an example from the combined world, from the modeling world. Now I want to to um, speak about the second universe of standardization. I think with what I said so far, uh, most of you might be familiar. Um, you use such kind of grassroots standards probably on a more or less everyday base, but there is another world of standardization that is um, the more formal standardization uh, driven by the so-called standard developing organizations that are recognized bodies like <clears throat> ISO at the international level. In Europe, you have SEN, Senelec um, as a um, uh, yeah, generally accepted um, uh, central body. Uh, you have national bodies like uh, DSI, uh, the British Standards in, in the UK or DEAN in Germany. And um, all these uh, work together, these um, organizations. You have different levels then um, of the target groups. So you have, um, when you have want to standardize something only in your institution or in your organization or company, you have internal standards. Um, you can have national standards for national things, but more and more this is decreasing because most uh, work is done now at a European or even international level. So that means European standards or international standards become 
more and more important, even though um, the number of is, is quite smaller compared to, for example, national or company standards worldwide. So how these um, um, international organizations like ISO, the International Standardization Organization, work now? Um, in, in principle, there are um, consisting of experts that are delegated from national mirror committees. So, for example, when you have a committee at ISO, um, you might have, or you typically will have then at a national level here, Dean in Germany, for example, uh, a mirror committee and experts of these mirror committee, then uh, they vote on uh, sending some delegates to the international committee. Uh, such an in international committee, but also the mirror committees, they might consist um, not only of one uh, committee that does it all, but uh, it might be the work it might be um, yeah um, scattered around different working groups that actually do the work. And then you have external liaison organizations that um, that help in the process of defining the standards. Um, this is a more uh, detailed view on that. So how um, ISO technical committee, one example of such a committee is, um, is um, yeah, uh, consistent, how, how that, um, how that is, um, uh, yeah, functioning. So you have the, the technical committee and that consists of P members, so participating members and observing members. And members in that sense means one national mirror committee that is member or one national uh, organization um, that is member. That's a bit complicated a system. It's a bit different from the um, scientific grassroots initiatives because uh, it brings in uh, really much complication that uh, you need to have agreements on the national level here from the national stakeholders uh, in one member uh, body. And then uh, you, you, you need some consensus at this level and this consensus is transported then to the technical committee at the international level. And uh, the complication is even uh, bigger because as I mentioned before, such a technical committee <clears throat> might consist of different subcommittees um, and or working groups. So not, it's not mandatory to have subcommittees or working groups. It's, also not um, mandatory to have subcommittee between a TC, a technical committee and a working group. Um, but so the, most, uh, most technical committees actually have at least subcommittees or working groups. And uh, so and at each of these different levels, you see with all these errors, uh, there are uh, contributions and who is delegating uh, to whom and, and so on. And then you have the international organizations that sends also experts to working groups in the ISO committees. Um, and uh, then you have differences in the voting rights. Uh, so participating members in a technical committee, for example, they have the voting right and even the duty to vote on a standard draft. Uh, observing members have no voting right or duty. The Asian organizations, they they, they are more the, um, well, the advisory, um, so there, there's no formal voting right, uh, but they can help actually uh, with the work and drafting. A complicated system, but um, it has been developed over decades and it seems to work somehow at least. Um, and this is uh, an important thing that, uh, that I mentioned just now. It's, um, it has, developed, has been developed over decades. That means such ISO committees typically are quite stable and the standards that they release, they are um, yeah, meant to be yeah, maintained for, uh, for a long, long time. And they are always regularly checked. An international standard, for example, is checked every five years if it's still valid or if it, or if it needs modification and so. So this, um, this aspect is, I think, uh, also a big difference to the grassroots initiatives where it's always dependent on how active the people are. Here's really a duty by the technical committees to do that work and maintain the standards. So you have uh, different types of ISO publications, so ISO deliverables. One 
probably all you all know ISO standards, the international standards of ISO, uh, which is highly normative, of course. Uh, there's also a, um, a less strong version of that, that is an ISO technical specification, also normative, but it is from um, from the binding um, uh, rules not as strong as in standard and uh, it's it's a bit uh, fuzzy the difference here. I, I can uh, show you a bit more in detail uh, right uh, after this, uh, what is the difference in detail. The technical reports, this is something different because it's only informative, so no normative elements are there, so there is not a text uh, that is containing shall have or shall not that is um, excluded from a technical report because this only should give a kind of a status um, report on the state of the art in a certain field with regard to standardization. You have also two other types that I won't uh, speak today uh, because they are not so often used. It's also publicly available specifications and the ISO international workshop agreements. So the most often used uh, type is probably the international standard and that provides rules, guidelines or characteristics for activities or for their results. Um, so that aims at uh, well, well, achieving the optimum degree of, um, of a certain uh, process, of a certain uh, um, testing, of a certain uh, practice. It can also be a guideline standard or a management system standard. Um, and it always has normative elements, so there are rules defined in a way you shall do this and that or you shall not do, do, you do this and that. Similar is the technical specification, but this addresses more uh, work still under technical development, so I think that is an interesting thing for research projects here. Um, when, there is, when a method is still kind of under development, but there's a certain level of maturity and uh, so people can already agree on a standard without uh, wanting that to, to be completely fixed for the next five years or so. So uh, that is used when, when you think, okay, it is needed immediately as a technical specification, um, but mm, you might want uh, to, to transfer that to a real international standard only later or you can also keep that as a technical specification for a longer time. Um, and uh, typically uh, it's intended to be used immediately after release. Um, technical specification provides a kind of a lightweight standardization in the ISO world uh, that is still normative. The technical report, I've said already a few things about that in the survey of the, uh, in the uh, summary of the different deliverables and uh, that provides more a state of the art uh, informative uh, uh, thing and it can be a bit compared to a, a scientific publication about standards in a certain field. So I said I will skip the information on the other two types but you might um, if, if the slides are shared afterwards, you might uh, want to check that or you can also check that on the ISO website actually. Uh, I want to speak a bit more about the uh, development part of an ISO deliverable. So um, when there is a certain need for standardization uh, that is brought uh, into a technical committee or a corresponding working group of a technical committee, and um, then this working group or a technical committee um, releases um, if there's an agreement and a consensus that this is really um, uh, uh, something that is needed, a standard that is needed, then a new project is started. And then uh, a long process, a tedious process of um, expert consensus within this committee, but with um, also uh, some input from, from external groups, liaisons and so on, um, starts and uh, then uh, after such a consensus process um, and several steps, there will be um, either there can be a direct release of technical specification, so that is um, a fast way um, 
to, to have such a lightweight standard or a technical report as a non-normative uh, non document. Or when you uh, when you go the way of a, a real ISO standard and in international standard, then there are different steps beyond that consensus within the technical committee. That means um, there are different stakeholders, ISO wide and uh, worldwide, uh, drawn in more and more to uh, to actually comment on a certain. Um, standard draft and then the comments are always resolved by the corresponding technical committee. So that's that's a kind of a back and forth uh, when you have a comment then it goes back to the, uh, the committee of ISO and then it's uh, resolved or, or discussed at least at this committee level. And after different uh, um, steps of that you have a draft international standard finally a Final draft international standard EFTIS, and uh, in the at the end of this long, at least the three-year process, mostly it's more. I mean, when you have also preliminary work before the project formally starts, um, then you have an international standard published at the end. So now speaking about what uh, all that has to do uh, with um, our field here with the life sciences. Um, we have the ISO TC 276 biotechnology, which is um, the, um, the ISO committee that deals with standardization in the field of biotechnology processes that includes terms and definition, biobanks and bioresources, analytical methods, bioprocessing, and also data processing, annotation, analysis, validation, comparability, and integration. Currently, 32 um, um, nations are, are contributing to that. So the mirror committee is in 32 nations and 15 plus 15 observing members. Um, the structure is like this that you I, I showed you here um, that you have these uh, five topics that uh, that are addressed, and this is reflected by the working groups. Um, so there's a working group dealing with terminology, one with biobanking, one with analytical methods, one with bioprocessing, and the one that I lead is dealing with data integration. So this is uh, now the structure as you can see it from the ISO website. So um, terminology working group, biobanks and bioresources, analytical methods, bioprocessing, and the data processing and integration that I want to give you now as an example um, of such a committee and uh, which standards are released there. So the scope of the data processing and integration working group of ISO TC 276 is uh, to develop standards uh, for traceable, searchable and interoperable data together with integrated data processing for biotechnology and the life sciences. And the main focus is here definition of data and model formats and their interfaces the definition of metadata and relations of data and models, and the quality management of process data and models. And of course, the working group will build on existing community standards and develop standards only where required and where gaps are identified. So it's not uh, meant to reinvent the wheel here. And all the work is um, coordinated with relevant other technical committees and standardization initiatives, also non-ISO initiatives, of course. Currently, the group um, is, well, it's always growing. Currently, there are 111 committee members, uh, plus a few aviation representatives and document monitors from 21 countries, actually. And we have liaisons to other ISO committees and to external uh, organizations like BBMI ERIC, the Biobanking and Biomolecular Research Resources Research Infrastructure in Europe, or the Global Alliance for Genomic and Health. That's a new mediation that uh, was established last year. Uh, the same also for EU stands for PM, a European project that I uh, briefly will mention at the end. So there are projects um, for standard, standards in development. Um, and the one I just will talk about in uh, two minutes is um, um, the one that I'm leading. Um, so I'm not only leading this working group, but also one project in it. 
and that's requirements for data formatting and description in the life sciences for downstream data processing and integration workflows. Long title, but also it's a broad range that we try to cover here. There are other standards that we develop, like data management and publication in my, microbiological resource centers, um, a more domain specific standard, or another general standard that is highly connected to um, the standard that I lead. That's data publication part one consideration and content, uh, concepts, and that's um, uh, suggested from an expert from the US. Um, and uh, uh, like for the other standards, it's not only these people working on that, it's, it's, it's a whole drafting team actually always working on these standard drafts and enhancing them and also resolving comments if there are comments from the other experts. Then you have provenance information management. Um, that is led by uh, Peter Hollow from BBMRI and your guide from Germany. And uh, these, yeah, this provenance information management uh, has two parts. Uh, planned are more than two parts. Such kind of standards can have more than one part. Um, and so it can release a whole series of standards um, and that doesn't have to be at once. You can have uh, released uh, and published the first part and then the second part and so on sequentially. So this is also um, possible. You also can do that in parallel, but uh, usually uh, people focus on for, uh, one part at once, typically. Then we have other less advanced standards like um, meta data specifications for human cells, a Chinese proposal, and general requirements for massive parallel sequencing, uh, part two, that is actually also advanced, but it's not uh, formally led by the working group uh, that I uh, chair, um, but it's a joint project with the working group for analytical methods in the same ISO committee. I, I don't want to, to go through the other examples. I mean, um, these were just examples what we do in this, um, in this working group. Now I want um, to spend uh, the rest uh, of the time on um, a standard that is meant to be a kind of a hub standard for uh, community standards and also provide a kind of a guideline for their use and at the same time some um, characteristics um, for uh, community standards um, for their development. And the one example why this is important to have such a interfacing or hub standard is, um, is, an, uh, is a sad story that happened more than 100 years ago in the great city uh, in the city of, of um, Baltimore in the great fire of Baltimore in 1904 the whole city burned down and the reason was that the fire brigades could not work together because the host couplings were different and people um, so the fire brigades coming from other towns like from New York City Philadelphia or even within uh, the town from other districts of the town could not work together because the host couplings were different. 600 different variations of host couplings we had at that time. Um, so there was a need of interoperability for interoperability standards. And that's actually um, what uh, ISO 2691 requirements for data formatting and description in the life sciences um, tries to do. So um, to present a reference framework standard for community standards to define requirements and rules for specific application of some community standards that are domain specific for certain types of data and certain domains. Um, yeah, especially for the formatting and documentation of the data um, that is captured in uh, processes um, and also for, for the computer uh, uh, models and the secondary data that is derived from the primary data. Um, that is always with their context, um, so with their metadata. And uh, there are also elements in this uh, standard that uh, deals with metadata and um, defines how the metadata should be um, described and what is important to capture with the metadata and so on. Um, it, the standard not recommends the workflows per se um, that can be um, um, quite complex. So when you have a certain workflow in your lab, for example, this is not uh, covered by such a standard. It's, it, it more provides the building uh, bricks um, to, to build such a workflow. Um, 
and then also a catalog of criteria and requirements for the data formats and model formats and metadata formats um, also is provided in this. So um, this is quite abstract now what I told you. Let's look a bit more deeper in how such a standard actually is, is then um, looking like. You have here the table of content for this ISO standard 2691. Um, so first you have a foreword, which is quite generic. Then you have an introduction to the whole topic. You have a scope that is very important because uh, it defines the fields of application for a standard. And um, the first typically are also accessible um, yeah, without any license. Uh, depending on, on, on the, uh, the release of an ISO standard, the rest might be uh, um, licensed, but a license doesn't mean that you have to spend a huge amount. Um, typically, such a standard costs yeah, around $100 uh, dollar or, or less, or 100 uh, euro or less, um, depending on, on different criteria. Um, so we had this discussion about um, releasing the standards under ISO also royalty free in the sense that uh, there is no um, um, no fee charged, but um, this is an ongoing process and discussion within ISO and uh, we, we have to see what comes out of that. Um, then after this more general parts like forward introduction scope, you have normative references, you have terms and definitions, and then um, here with chapter four in this example, the real standard uh, starts. The, the, all the, the rest before is, is more the background, the normative references, terms and definition, and so on, which is of course an important part of the standard, but the central normative elements are described then later, like uh, here in the 2691 standard um, in the chapter about criteria for formats and identifiers, then another chapter for technical criteria and requirements. Then there's one chapter about semantic criteria criteria and requirements for, for um, community standard. Then um, the standard provides uh, requirements for ontologies suitable for annotation of biological data, requirements for domain specific data standards as an eight chapter, in the ninth chapter, the last chapter of the normative part uh, provides requirements for data repositories for biological data. Then there's a quite intensive annex. Such an annex can be either normative uh, again or also informative like in our case. Um, and uh, we have two annexes here for 2691 standard. One is uh, about recommended formats for life science data, and one is about minimal reporting standards for data models and metadata. So that is the scope of this uh, standard that is um, uh, quite important to keep in mind. So the document um, specifies requirements for the consistent formatting and documentation of data and corresponding metadata in the life sciences and biotechnology. And this includes biomedical research, non-human biological research and development, as well as manual or computational workflows that systematically, systematically capture, record, or integrate data and corresponding metadata in the life sciences for other purposes. I don't want to read all this. That, I just want that you get a feeling how such a standard is written. Um, and um, that you then get a feeling what such a standard uh, tries to regulate and standardize and what it can standardize and what it can't. Um, one important thing is that you have also some fields as examples given in such a scope, like here for the ISO 2691, it says that um, uh, it's, it's applicable to domains in biotechnology in the life sciences, such as, but not limited to genomics, including massive parallel sequencing, metagenomics, epigenomics, and functional genomics, transcriptomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, glycomics, entomology, immunochemistry, life science, imaging, synthetic biology, and systems biology, systems medicine, and related fields. So um, you see, the wording in such a standard is always quite critical. So you, when you say 
um, such as, and you have to also say, but not limited to, not to make it too limit, the, the limitation too strong. And when you have to exclude some parts, like for example, for food production or clinical laboratory diagnostics, there are other ISO committees dealing with these fields. You also have to state that in a scope, um, like here, uh, this example. Then the normative part, um, just um, rough, uh, to get a rough idea, you have some, some criteria um, provided as shell criteria. I already mentioned that. When you have a normative document, it typically contains uh, information like a biological or conceptual entity identifier shall be considered qualified if uh, it possesses a specific namespace and so on. So um, again, only an example, you can have then also um, here some uh, description how metadata of a URI, a unique resource identifier should look like, or you can have um, information how an IRI should look like, um, how a URI and IRI um, are related to each other. And, and what is the difference? And um, then you have um, examples for the semantic criteria and requirements. Um, here, this can be delivered as a table, for example. You have qualifiers or predicates used for annotation of biological data. And they are described here what the meaning is, uh, is in this sense. And that's still normative here. Um, what is not normative? Uh, as I mentioned before, it's the annex that provides a kind of a reference to existing community standards and how they should be used for which type of data. Uh, so you have here Annex A with recommended formats for life science data. And there you have, uh, for example, um, a reference to sequence formats for nucleic acids and how they should use and for which uh, problems. Um, you have, I mentioned the combine community in the beginning as a a grassroots initiative um, that develops uh, yeah, formats for um, computer models um, in the biological field um, and, uh, and corresponding standards. Um, and these are referenced also in this annex. Um, annex B then deals with uh, minimal reporting standards for data models and metadata. So um, there also you have uh, some more general comments and also information that you find more uh, up-to-date uh, information in online resources. And you have um, a list of, of referenced minimum information standards. And um, uh, this is now, these are a few captures from, from the current version of this draft, uh, ICCD 2691. Um, what we have concluded now at our most recent meeting, end of last year, uh, in, in ISO TC 276 Working Group 5, um, is that we want to have an online resource like fair sharing. Actually, we selected also fair sharing as such an online resource as a kind of a live index that, um, that provides um, for the reference standards that I just uh, showed you from the annexes, a few examples. I showed you, um, and uh, such a live uh, index can then uh, maintain such kind of references. And um, this is um, has advantages, of course, uh, over purely static lists in an ISO document like the one in the two annexes, annex A and B in the standard that I just introduced to you. Um, so that can be maintained. Uh, you can have, uh, you can show the life cycle of the community standards that develop, and they might die out, or they might be uh, become part of another standard, and so on. And all that can be better represented in such a resource like fair sharing. But I don't want to to go into detail here. I think you probably most of you are familiar with the resource, and I think there have been webinars about that in the past already, or there will be. Um, how that can be used then as a live annex for, for an ISO standards is shown here. So you have uh, fair sharing collections and um, by combine as a grassroots um, initiative releasing standards has a, a combined collection here with all the combined standards um, in fair sharing. 
um, and you even can show some resources that use these standards, so tools and, and resources, online resources that use these standards. Um, and then you have the information, of course, about the different standards in fair sharing. And uh, similarly, like this, um, uh, a fair sharing collection for such an ISO standard can be also released. Um, there are more examples of the standards from the ISO committee that I'm heading, but um, for the sake of time, I will skip these now. And at the end, I just want to provide you a glimpse how that might be um, all come together in the future. So I'm part of the network, uh, E stands for PM, Standards for Incidical Models for Personalized Medicine. And there we establish a pan-European expert forum to tackle the complexity of big data integration for in silico methodologies in personalized medicine. So it's focused on a certain topic, uh, but tries to actually harmonize um, health or disease data integration strategies across Europe. That of course also means um, that uh, um, yeah, uh, the existing uh, standards in the field are um, uh, kind of checked how they can be harmonized and uh, and um, to to do so we 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 then plan to work together with um, yeah committees of ISO with uh, yeah grassroots initiatives like Combine and others um, to actually harmonize better these standards grassroots standards um, but at the same time also ISO standards and I hope I can could show you today with uh, the ISO 26.1 standard. That this also starts to put a, a kind of a meta standard over the existing forests of of, uh, of the different grassroots standards. So a lot of information, and I think I spoke a bit too long, but I hope uh, you got a bit of an idea um, about the different universes of standardization and how the processes uh, at ISO work. Thank you.